Welcome to the History of Retina's Leaders and Legends series. The purpose of these interviews is to capture firsthand stories from individuals with unique retinal insights of historical significance. Through these discussions, we hope to provide a fuller understanding of the evolution of both the science and practice of retina through the lens of those individuals who have actually lived it. Today, it is an absolute privilege to welcome a remarkable figure who has certainly made his mark on the history of retina, Dr. Yale Fisher. Currently affiliated with Vitreous Retina Maculate Consultants in New York, Dr. Fisher's impressive credentials extend beyond that. He serves as an attending surgeon at the Manhattan Eye and Ear Infirmary, holds the position of clinical professor of ophthalmology at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center, and is a voluntary clinical professor at the renowned Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. Dr. Fisher's impact on the world of retina is undeniable. He has led the way in the development of novel techniques and instruments in our field, particularly in ultrasonography and vitreoretinal surgery. His pioneering work in ocular endoscopy has expanded the boundaries of what is possible in our field, and he has shared his expertise extensively with audiences both nationally and internationally. Dr. Fisher's dedication to advancing the field goes beyond his lectures and innovations. He is a patent holder who has also authored six books, published innumerable scientific articles, and presented extensively throughout numerous scientific exhibits all testaments to his unwavering commitment to advancing our field. However, what truly distinguishes Dr. Fisher is his profound humility. Beneath the accolades and achievements lies a man who remains as captivated by the world of ophthalmology and as passionate about patient care as he was in his formative years. Today, we have the honor of welcoming Dr. Yale Fisher to leaders and legends. Dr. Fisher, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. So we're gonna talk a little bit about things that have driven you in your career to be where you are today. So could we go way back and look at what brings you into medicine? Sure. I was uh, brought up in a small town in New Jersey. I was born in Patterson, but raised in Glen Rock. It's a small town that's about 4,000 and I went to a little public school. I used to uh, participate in sports, and at one time I was in Little League, believe that or not. <laughs> While I was there, I used to go down for a cherry Coke after each session, and I went into a place to have the Coke that I always went for, and the man sat down next to me, and he was uh, in Oshkosh, bagosh clothes, he had a toolkit around his middle, and he ordered a steak sandwich. He choked on it. He choked on the sandwich. He fell off the chair, and he died. Hmm. Seven people were trying to rouse him. They called for an ambulance. They could never get the steak out of his throat because it was just before the Heimlich maneuver was around. This was 1955. I went home on my bicycle. My mother said, what happened? Because I was crying. And I told her what happened. And she said, are you OK? I said, I'm going to be a doctor. I never want that to happen to me again, not to know what to do. And that was the first time that I ever decided to go into medicine. And from then, it was a constant push to get to that goal. And so get me from high school into college. <laughs> My high school teacher, who was the uh, college advisor, had just come into practice in the school, and she had decided that she would have me go to her school, which was a wonderful school called Franklin and Marshall. And I came home with the application. My father said, what about the Northeast and some of the Ivy League schools? I said, I don't know. 
I applied to several different schools, one of which was Cornell, and I was accepted early. And I'm not sure, so it, it wasn't early admission in those days, they didn't have it. But I was accepted at Cornell, and that changed my life. And it's hard to get you anywhere else after Cornell. So yes, move us into medical school and your training. Huh. I was trying to save my father money, so I carried a lot of credits for my first two years, and I had fulfilled all of them necessary for medical school by the end of my sophomore year. I applied to medical schools, and I was lucky enough to get into Cornell Medical School, which allowed me to do a dual program. The first year of medical school, which was in New York City, not in Ithaca, New York, was my last year at Cornell. So I double registered and went to Cornell Medical School. So when does the passion for ophthalmology? Hmm. My anatomy teacher was named Tom Meikle. He eventually became dean of the medical school. He used to have a very good friend named John McLean. McLean was the chairman at New York Hospital of Ophthalmology. And McLean would come down to the first year students and ask Meikle, Dr. Meikle, who he thought had hands enough to do surgery. I didn't know anything about this. And then many years later, three years later, calls me into his office and said, you know, I've been following you. I don't know if he did or he didn't, but he said, I want you to come in for a short time, an elective with me. And I said, sure, I'll do it. What he showed me in those two months fascinated me. And I just never looked back. Where's your post-residency training? John McLean said, I have called Dr. Norton at Bascom Palmer. And he said, I've asked him to train you in ophthalmology. And he said, I bought you a ticket to go down to Miami to get an apartment. And I said, wow, that's strange. So he said, you've got to do me a favor. When you go there, be sure you only speak with Dr. Norton and do not talk to anyone else. I thought that was strange, but I decided to do it. And I walked in, and unfortunately, Dr. Norton was stuck in the operating room. So I sat in his office, and after about an hour, another gentleman walked in. I didn't recognize him. He sat down next to me, and he said, my name is Dr. Victor Curtin. Why don't you tell me about yourself? And I said, uh, my name is Yale Fisher, but I really can't talk to anybody here. That was definitely the wrong thing to say to Dr. Curtin. And <laughs> from there, things went pretty much south. I didn't have a very good interview. And um, Dr. Curtin turned to me and he said, well, young man, he said, um, you might get in here, but it would be over my dead body. And I had never heard that before. That's pretty much a no. <laughs> I thought so. So I waited for another hour. Dr. Norton came in. There was a small note on his desk signed by Dr. Curtin, which I did not read, but I was sitting in front of his desk. And he came in. He said, oh, I see you've met Dr. Curtin. And I said, yes. I don't think it went very well. He said, well, I also see that you're in line to go into the military. I had signed up for the Bury Plan, and I had two years to go and serve in the military during the Vietnam War. He said, why don't you go into the military and come back afterwards? And he said, by that time, probably Dr. Curtin will have forgotten a few things. Dr. Curtin never forgets. Never. When I got back, I went right to Dr. McLean's office and said, what happened here? I mean, something went terribly wrong. And he asked me what happened, and I said, told him the story. He said, well, maybe perhaps um, we can get you a position for at least a year before you enter the Army uh, somewhere else. And I said, where? He said, well, I have a colleague, friend of mine at Manhattan Eye and Ear, and he's running the residency training program, and I know most of the people there. You can get a one-year program there. I went there for an interview. The person that interviewed me was Larry Yanuzzi. <laughs> he was head of uh, residency instruction. I met him and I met 
uh, Dr. Constantine, who was the head of the program, and uh, they accepted me for one year. After two months of being in that program at Manhattan Eye and Ear, I get a small postcard, just a card, from the Army saying, you are now fully approved for your residency training program. Only one problem. I didn't have a residency training program. I had been approved for a single year. So I started to apply to every other place that I could think of that might have a position for a second year program, and then I would go have to deal with the Army. But once again, I was lucky. Dr. Iannuzzi was working on a new project to use fluorescein and geography for detecting infiltrations in the eye, both the retina and the choroid. And one of my interviews, believe it or not, was at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Hospital, Harvard, where I had had a fiasco before. And on the way out the door to go to it, um, he said, you know, I've been thinking about it. Perhaps we can see whether there's any infiltration in leukemic patients uh, with fluorescein angiography. No one knew whether you could or you couldn't, but I went out the door, caught a plane, flew up to Harvard, and I was to be interviewed by the man who was the head of the program to get in there. His name was Henry Allen. And he said, tell me something. He said, I just had a young woman who had changed her prescription shortly after finding out that she had acute leukemia. He said, can you tell me any reason why it might change her prescription? I said, well, perhaps she's had an infiltration in her choroid and that indeed that might have changed the thickness of the choroid. And um, I said, by chance, did you do a fluorescein angiogram? I had no idea really what I was talking about. Right. I had just heard it from Dr. Yanuzi as I was walking out the door for the airport. He turns his card over and he said, you know, that's a very good idea. And he said, listen, he said, you can come up here, but it's going to be a six-month rotation before you can be accepted. And quite frankly, I would rather have you stay where you are. I said, they're not going to accept me. They only accepted me for one year. He said, I will call them. And he called them, and then I was accepted. It's amazing sort of the power of the, the individual conversations, especially then. You oh. know, I don't think our residents or fellows understand that at all now. No. So... So much seems almost serendipitous, but in a way, it's really that personal connection. It was all a personal connection. Tell me a little bit about the journey into ultrasound. Sure. That's pretty easy because I was at Manhattan Eye and Ear on a summertime evening, and I was responsible for locking up. And there were many different areas in the pediatric division, division of strabismus that had to be locked. And I got to this one room just before this small elevator that was in the annex building, and the room was open. And there was a gentleman, middle-aged, opening a huge box, pulling electronic equipment out of the box. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm putting together something that I had built in my garage. It's an imaging device. I said, can I, can I, can I watch you? He said, yes but only if you stay till it's finished. And around midnight of that time, he had put together something and he, that he said was an imaging device for the inside of the eye that had opaque media. At around midnight, we turned it on and it wobbled and it was grainy. But as I held the handheld probe, which he gave me in my hand up to my eye, I could see the inside of my eye. And I said, wow. This is unreal. Two weeks later, we started a clinic for contact B-scan ultrasound at Manhattan Eye and Ear. We recognized quickly that if you shot all of the examination through the eye, you were gonna to have to deal with the artifacts produced by the lens. And now we needed a technique and an, uh, a method of examining the inside of an eye from a different position outside the lens. But now we're not used to those kind of positions. We're used to anterior, posterior cuts, usually from our pathology examination. But this was not. To avoid the lens, you had to move the probe. To move the probe, you had to know what the screen registration was going to be. 
And then we figured out that it was just as important to know what the real time of movement was as it was to see the cross section. So first you had to be able to register where you were looking from, see what the screen represented. Second, you had to look at what there was movement and how things wiggled inside the eye. And the last thing was to be able to interpret how strongly the reflections were and put them in a position so they would be perpendicular to your probe to get back all of the ultrasonic material so it wouldn't miss being seen on the screen. And then you had to decide what you were looking at. I don't think even to this day a lot of people understand how much real-time movement plays a role in interpretation so that you have to really understand where is the eye, how does the eye move, and what does those movements translate into on the ultrasound. So where does all that, where, where, where are you generating that knowledge from? It was rapidly evolving that the only way you could find out was if you did clear media cases. So I realized how in the world are you going to interpret an opaque situation unless you have some idea of what you're dealing with. So the only way in those days that you could have some idea of what you're dealing with is if you could look in. So we started looking initially at patients who had clear media. I would do the examination with ultrasound, and then I'd either put on an indirect ophthalmoscope or someone else would, and they would grade whether or not I had picked up what was obvious and could be photographed, even with an old camera, so that we could prove that this looked like this. It's not dissimilar to what we're doing with OCT, except now when the media became opaque, it became much more difficult. You had to be more and more certain, and that's where real time became real important. We'll come back to the ultrasound story again, but you know, just as much as you have given into ultrasound, you know, I don't think people appreciate how much your clinical skills and surgical abilities have played a role with you. So take me through that a little bit. Okay. What gets you into the operating room? I found out that uh, David Meyer was doing a lot of retinal detachment work. So I had known him through Larry. Larry had a familiarity with David. And I called him and said, could I come down and spend some time with him? He said, sure. He said, but there's a young man that you might want to spend some time with that I think would be more in your area of interest. I said, sure, what's his name? He said, it's Steve Charles. I said, sure, that would be great. So I went down to the first time to see David Meyer and I wound up spending most of my time with Steve. They operated at different times in a small hospital where they were, um, I will say, uh, yeah. took over pretty much everything. Right. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Serendipitously, you're, you're going to see one person and you sure. end up with- Steve. With Steve. Yes. I think of Steve with that engineering background and the same thought process that I see you bringing in to, to ultrasound. Sure, that was the meld. Right. Because I said, look, I'll be happy to go over what I've learned in ultrasound. A lot of this he had already begun. And I said, I'll share with you what I know if you'll share with me what you know. And he said, that's a great idea. And that just, just went on and on and on and on. I would fly down on a, I guess it was a Wednesday evening and I would operate with, um, I would observe, I wasn't operating there, I would observe uh, David Meyer, and then Steve, I would see during the daytime, Dr. Meyer liked to operate at night. On one trip, I went down to see Steve, and I had brought with me a pair of scissors that I got from the ear, nose, and throat people for doing foramen ovales. Scissors, vertical scissors. And on the plane down to, uh, I guess it was Memphis, uh, where they were located, I was trying to shave off the back of the scissors so that the angle between the scissors and the shaft was more smooth so it would get inside a 20 gauge uh, incision site. And um, the uh, flight attendant said, what was I doing? Because I was working with this metal file on this plane I guess it was an eight o'clock flight at night and got in quite late. And that was the first time that we'd ever had vertical scissors. And we tried them the next day in the operating room to try to produce incisions in membrane on the surface of the retina, and they worked. 
When you do that and you're doing it with Steve and it's for the first time, do you ever think of how unique that is? I mean, if I look at our fellow and say, we're gonna shave an instrument on the flight down and then we're gonna stick it in the patient's eye tomorrow morning, they would be appalled, right? Sure. I mean, there, there was no equipment. Right. It was just a, a strange set of circumstances and anything that you could think of, you could do. You didn't go through any approval process. You just made sure it was sterile and that you thought it would help in a situation where you had nothing before. And from that came the ideas of vertical scissors and partial vertical scissors and horizontal scissors and all the other things that developed. And it wasn't just one person. Pretty much everybody shared their experiences, either by phone calls or by uh, meetings that we went to. It was a unique and extraordinary time. And I never met anybody in those times that said, no, I don't want you to know what I do. Never. It was all shared experience. So you're with Steve, one of the most amazing surgical innovators in our field, and you're going back to, to New York and you're taking that with you. Yes, so, I had never, no one in New York had seen an air fluid exchange. So what's that like? I mean, I, I'll tell you, uh, there was, a gentleman that I worked with a lot named Don Schaefer, and Don Schaefer was one of the original ones in the Retina Society. He had come down to New York from Boston and was quietly doing retinal detachment work, mostly buckles. He had never seen a vitrectomy. And I told him that I had spend, been spending time with Steve and I was interested in trying to expand this to Manhattan Eye and Ear and to New York in general. I asked him if he would help me because I didn't have the Honestly, I, I was frightened. And he said, I'll go with you to the operating room. The first patient was a patient with a regmatogenous retinal detachment. I did remove the vitreous as I'd seen Steve do. And I did an air fluid exchange and the retina went flat. And I heard Don Schaefer say in a squeaky little voice because he'd had a recurrent laryngeal nerve problem from some previous surgery, oh my gosh. That's unbelievable. And that was the first time I think he'd ever seen vitrectomy. What a moment, right? Oh, it was even, it was extraordinary. I get chills just yeah, hearing it. It was just amazing. The next time that was really um, unbelievable was at Manhattan Ironier. And it was um, a few years later. And a gentleman came by and he told me that his name was Dr. So-and-so. And he said, do you mind if I watch you? I said, I'd be happy to have you watch me as long as you're a physician and you feel comfortable in an operating room with sterile technique. He said, yeah, that's no problem. And sure enough, he wound up in my operating room and he asked me, he said, what are you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna try to remove this membrane from the surface of the retina. He didn't say a word. The membrane came off safely and everything was fine. And by the time I had finished, he was out of the operating room. I never saw him again. About three weeks later, I get a phone call. My name is doc, Dr. So-and-so. I, I um, want to know if you did the following. I said, who is this? He said, I observed you. And I said, well, why are you asking me these questions? He said, I'm also a reporter for the New York Times. Hmm. I had not known that. I said, well, you know, if you want to make sure you got it right, can I read it? He said, no, it's my observations not yours. <laughs> I said, okay. I didn't hear from him again. Well, that Sunday, August, I believe, 19th, not that I remember, I went to get my New York Times that used to be delivered. There was no online. And on the front page of the New York Times, I saw an article at the curve. Dr. Yale Fisher places a blade behind the eye of I almost died because it was such an invasion. I felt I was completely vulnerable and it changed a lot of what I was doing because it gave a lot of exposure to the field of vitreoretinal retinal surgery. Take me to what, what your life looks like now. You're recognized by the New York Times. Oh. You're a vitreoretinal retinal surgeon. You're pivotal in the development of ultrasound. I mean, so many things develop. Photocoagulation in the operating room develop. Everybody now says, well, just give me the laser and I can laser it and they'll curve and they'll do anything. These things started with 
with uh, photocoagulation with a xenon light source. But then laser came in very quickly, and I realized that there were times when you couldn't see inside the eye with a microscope. The cornea would go bad. The anterior chamber would be um, clouded by the bad cornea or a bubble that would come up around the edges. And I said, wouldn't it be nice if we had something that we could avoid using a microscope? And that led to the idea of an endoscope. And I met an engineer from Canada named Richard Weitz, who is a, uh, also a tinkerer, but also had a company. And he also was interested in developing new devices. And he helped me a great deal. He said, you know, I think we've gotten miniaturization in endoscopes where we could probably get a 20 or a 21 gauge endoscope with about 30,000 pixels, if we're lucky, from Mitsubishi or somebody like that. And he said, we could probably build an endoscope. He said, but I'd really be interested in building a three-dimensional ultrasound machine also. And I said, well, why don't we do both? So now we have vitreoretinal retinal surgery, the possibility of building an endoscope and simultaneously building a three-dimensional ultrasound device, which I thought would be helpful because it seemed to be so difficult for people to visualize three-dimension from two-dimensional cross-sections. After about, I'm going to say, a few about nine months for the endoscope and about three years for the three-dimensional ultrasound, they all came to fruition about the same time. But then how do you use them? And that was the next phase of both ultrasound and endoscopy. Now listen, you, you're not just in New York anymore. You had to stay away from Florida for a long time after your initial introduction with Dr. Curtin, Curtin. for Dr. Norton. Tell me how we get you back to, to Bascom Palmer. It is the end of the story. For years after that first experience with Dr. Curtin, I avoided him because I was frightened of his response. I decided uh, in 19, and when I, I guess it was when my daughter was in sixth grade and she was gonna go into seventh, that I was going to retire and move to Florida. And I wasn't gonna do anything. I got a phone call two weeks after I arrived in Florida from Carmen Poliafito. He said, I heard you moved to Florida. He said, I want you to come back. I want you to come to Rounds one time. Come down to Miami and go to Bascom Palmer. I was still gun shy because of Victor. And I said, I don't know if I should come. He said, well, just come once. He didn't know the story. He invited me and I said, all right, I'll come. And I went down there and on that particular day, I walked in, there were 200 people in the room. There was one seat left. And he said, this is Dr. Fish. Dr. Fisher who's gonna teach us how to use ultrasound. And he said, Dr. Fisher, why don't you sit down right over there? It was right next to Victor Curtin. And I said, oh my gosh. How's that heart rate? Oh, <laughs> I was terrified. Right. He didn't say a word to me. And for three years, I would come in and that became my seat. There was a bird flu epidemic in 2010, I believe it was, and Tamiflu was unavailable in Florida, but I had some, and I decided I was going to give some to Victor Curtin. He was right next to me, and he said, you don't have to give that to me. He had never even said hello to me except, good morning. And I said, you know, you might want this. He said, no, I'll get some from the pharmacy. I said, I think they're out. I went upstairs after rounds to go to the triage clinic. And while I was looking through a, a slit lamp, I felt a finger on my shoulder. And I looked around, and from this close to my face was Victor Curtin's face. And I said, can I help you? And he said, you know, if you have that Tamiflu, they're out here. I'd like to keep it for the weekend until they get more. I said, sure. Take it. He never said another word, but from that day on, he became my closest friend. I went to his secretary, Kathy Corser, and I said, you know, Kathy, you may not know the story of what happened to Victor Curtin with, uh, with myself 60 years ago. And she said, when did this interview take place? I said, it was in March of 1966. She said, March, 1966. She turns around and opens a drawer and Victor Curtin, after every interview, and I think he did over a thousand, would type what he thought of the candidate 
on a carbon paper that had these glassine backs that nobody knows about anymore. Correct. And he had his own typewriter. And he would type out what the, what the, the whole thing was like. And she said, you said March. She goes through this file and pulls out this piece of paper marked on the day that I was there 60 years ago. And I said, can I see it? She said, no, let me read it first. And she said, there's nothing on this page. She did give it to me. I did read it. And indeed, he had never included any of the discussion that we had. Right. So I used to tell this as a story of absolution. It wasn't absolution for him. It was for me. How long do we have to keep you for? Because you're like a rare treasure <laughs> in our field. Medicine still remains to me, a, it's, it's a passion. It's just an ongoing passion. And it will be that way till I die. This is what I love. And my wife asked me, are you doing what you want? Yes, I'm doing what I want. I love that. So Dr. Fisher, thank you so much for joining us. Hmm. Thank you for having me. 